one of the things that I think by now everyone here, if you're paying attention, will pick up at COP15. If you're if you're attending the, the meetings, uh, you'll certainly pick it up in headlines around. Is a, a completely understandable desire to grasp for uh, the kind of hope that says we can walk a lap. Oh, we can relax. It's fine after all. Mm. Uh, so uh, every time someone comes out with a finding that says maybe it's not as bad as we think, you'll see a, a, a lot of headlines about it. Uh, and then what you won't see is the, the really detailed critique of those findings that constitutes how science really works, uh, how we find out what we know. And I want to ask you to play hard guys again. Uh, I'm sorry to do this, but uh, there is currently, uh, I would say, uh, there are two sources of, of hope being peddled at COP15, both of which I think deserve to be uh, thrown out a hall, uh, thrown out the window of a tall building, um, and I, I want to ask you to do that. Uh, one of them is geoengineering via things like ocean acidification. Tell us why uh, you don't buy it. I'm uh, sorry, via things like ocean fertilization. Let me get that right. Uh, and the other is a finding that uh, maybe lobsters under some circumstances, as adults, can grow their shells a little faster when you put more CO2 in the water. Uh, these are things my friends have sent to me saying, Brad, see, we don't have to worry about it after all. Uh, so, uh, again, we'll, we'll, this time we'll come from, from O back this way. Okay, so, so one of the, um, I guess, the mythologies that's being trotted around in response to a large amount of science that's being done on ocean creatures building their shells and so on, is that some of them don't get affected. And in fact, this paper, I think, that you're referring to, um, eight of the 21 species that were looked at uh, showed no effect. But what they don't tell you, of course, is that the others, which are the majority, showed huge effects, the oysters, the mussels, and so on. You know, those are really destabilizing effects. Just one or two species like that, something fundamental as a sort of, you know, bivalve mollusks having sudden change in their fortunes can just tip the whole thing in, in, into imbalance. So we've got to be very careful when we hear these stories. And I think you're right, people cherry pick. This is one of the, uh, I guess, the most dishonest parts of those types of arguments where they cherry pick out examples and say that this is really the reason we shouldn't be worried. And I, and I think that's, uh, I'll leave something for the others to say, but that, that to me is one of the reasons why we're in so much trouble is we've got the fouling, the clouding of the issues by the cherry picking that's being done by what I call denialists. So they're not sceptics. These are denialist sort of elements that are denying a problem that's really fundamental. Let me take the geoengineering question. Um, there are two kinds of geoengineering um, proposals. Um, there are ones that just address the heat problem that CO2 and other greenhouse gases make as putting little umbrellas between us and the sun and so on. Um, we can forget about all of them because they don't address the acidification issue. And it, it doesn't matter what the temperature of the planet is, if we acidify the ocean, we'll kill all the existing life. It won't be completely dead, but it'll look like some silicon-based ocean from 44 million years ago. Um, then there are the schemes that uh, claim to be able to uh, address the CO2, maybe even in the ocean, and and uh, you know I would, from a scientific and engineering point of view, I would just call them false hope. The the only thing we know that really works is to stop putting CO2 in the atmosphere, and that means we have to make electricity without making CO2, or if we're very clever and we make the CO2, we have to find a way to bury it forever. Well, I'll I'll address that work that that you're talking about where uh, some species appeared not to be sensitive and even grew bigger, right, with high CO2. And the only thing that was measured in that study was the calcium carbonate, the, the, the shell material. And usually in other studies, there have been a couple species that did calcify more. They made more shell material. But it came at a cost because they then had to put, because they were putting more energy into making the shell, they could not put as much energy into growing or into reproduction. Very often the shell is weak, is thin, and would crush more readily. So we, you know, we don't know. 
you know, what happened in that study, whether that was a good thing or if it was just a compensation because the water was so unfavorable for them. But regardless, it doesn't much change. I mean, uh, the different species are going to be react differently. Some are going to be more sensitive than others. And even if there's a slight difference in their sensitivity, if you propagate that, you amplify that difference over successive generations, you end up with very large differences. And essentially what we're talking about is the wholesale reorganization of the food web in the oceans. Perhaps I could go back and amplify some of what Tony was saying, that the geoengineering just really doesn't make sense. And one of the reasons for this is the scale at which it would be required. Do you think in a, a year like this year, we're putting over 40 billion tons of carbon dioxide into the atmosphere by burning things? Now, it's hard to imagine one ton of carbon dioxide. There's a, a balloon outside the Bella Center showing what one ton would look like as a gas. You could imagine it frozen out to solid CO2. It would be about a cubic meter in size. So a billion tons would be a, a cubic kilometer. 40 billion tons, you're talking a good-sized heap of CO2. Just imagining the sort of process that you could remove that is really, I think, beyond sensible hope. As Tony said, wishful thinking. Now, go ahead. Yes, we, we are due for questions for the audience, and they are more than welcome. Yes, sir. Why don't you step up? We've well, you, you got a mic there. Yes. Please identify yourself and uh, speak clearly. Jack Hittery with the Huffington Post uh, from New York. Um, one, wonderful film and wonderful effort. Thank you for putting this all together today. I guess my question is, um, the filmmakers mentioned that until recently this issue was not really on the radar. Where has the fisheries industries been? I mean, it's great that scientists are involved, it's great that we're doing more research, great that you're making a film, but there's people with billions of dollars of vested interest in this issue. Um, in other areas, in other sectors that have been affected by climate change, we see a lot more of the industry participation. Um, where, where is the industry? You will see it. In fact, uh, there is a Bering Sea crabber here who came from Seattle to work on this issue with me. Uh, that's what I do, is elicit that, that response, and it is happening. What, what we have 10 or 12 of them in D.C. this week talking to senators and their staffs saying, if you like your fish, hmm. let's have a carbon policy. So it, it's happening. That's that true. Point. Yeah. So, to be clear, there there are some people in the industry who get it right away and would, would easily get on board, and um, I didn't start with them. Uh, that's the easy hit, and everybody who is in politics knows who, to, who they can expect to hear that from. Uh, I wanted them to hear it from uh, the people in the fishing industry they did not expect to hear from about this. A uh, an influential, powerful. Uh, serious business group, and those people are beginning to step up. Uh, they're stepping up uh, with a lot of caution. Uh, they don't want to shoot their feet off. Uh, they want to do this in a way that works for them and the world. Uh, it's going to take longer than I wish, but that's how it is with everyone who thinks well about their complex interests. And when, when you watch the UN process, it's painfully slow, but it does advance. And I think the same can be said of this industry. Uh, as we go forward, I think, and I could be proven wrong, uh, but I think even the most reticent of the major players in seafood will become vocal. Uh, some are there now. More will be.